This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, Lisa's. <coughs> Classic example of substance over form definitions. You may be required to write out definitions, define this for two marks. I'm not going to begin to suggest that you start going through all the IASs and IFRSs and learning all the definitions. I think it would be unreasonable for me to even think about suggesting it. I think I gave you, for instance, enough work last night to uh, prevent you, really, from doing some voluntary definition learning. I presume you didn't do any voluntary definition learning, but you did do those quick examples at the back of the course notes. Yeah. But that's a rebuttable presumption. I can presume it until you prove me wrong. Okay, finance lease. A lease that transfers substantially all the risks and rewards of ownership of an asset to the lessee. Title may or may not eventually be transferred. It doesn't matter. It's the transfer of substantially the whole of the risks and rewards of ownership. Tell me what you understand by substantial. As in substantially the whole. You had a substantial whole here, didn't you, last week? Sponsored by uh, Tele2? They created a substantial whole, didn't they? Uh, substantially the whole of the risks and rewards. What's substantial? Is it um, freedom of use of the asset? But the lessors will pay the insurance, the maintenance, and the repair costs? No, that wouldn't be substantially the whole. All right. Where you pay the insurance, but they pay the repair and the maintenance. Would that be substantially the whole? Or would it be substantially the whole if they could have access to that asset at any time within the next two years if they needed to use it. Is that substantial of the whole? I'm looking for answers here. We did quite a bit of Shakespeare when I was at school, and Shakespeare is famous for writing soliloquies uh, where the actor will stand and talk to himself or talk to the audience. I feel at times that I'm in the middle of a Shakespearean play. I talk to myself. I can ask questions. I can answer them. You could join in. So, if I have freedom of use of the asset and I pay the insurance, but the lessor pays the repairs and maintenance costs, would that be substantially the whole? I don't think so, Mike. I think that would still not be substantially the whole. Really? Why? Because the lessor has still got this obligation to pay the maintenance and the repair costs. Ah, but what if you pay the maintenance and he only pays the repair? Would that be substantial of the whole? Well, you're getting pretty close there. Does anybody else want to join in on this? Or am I soliloquizing? I should carry on, shall I? Okay. This is a dagger I see before me, the handle towards my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I see thee still, and yet I have thee not. Now then. I thought you know which one that from. What's that from? Hamlet? Yeah, it's Hamlet. Maybe. Um, what if I pay the maintenance and the repairs and the insurance and I've got the freedom of use of the asset but the lessor has retained the right of access to the asset in case one of his own machines breaks down so he can come and then use it. For instance, a printing machine. And if his own printing machine breaks down, he can come along and, and use the one that, that I am using under a lease. Would that be substantial of the whole? I don't think that would. I tell you, if he retains the right of access, then I don't think I have substantial of the whole of risks and rewards. But it's a variable matter, and you may have to argue it. And you may have to say, well, I'm thinking that maybe this isn't substantial of the whole. But it might be. If it isn't, then it's this. If it is, then it's that. Okay? A line is drawn 
It's not meant to be. It's not meant to be a quantitative decision. It's meant to be a qualitative decision. But accountants have designed this line, and they say, if the minimum lease payments at the present value of the minimum lease payments is equal to or greater than 90% of the fair value of the asset, then it's a finance lease. Yeah, if the present value of the minimum lease payments is greater than or equal to ninety percent of the fair value then it's a finance lease. Again? Lease term is the non-cancellable period for which the lessee is contracted to lease the asset, together with any further terms for which the lessee has the option to continue to lease the asset, with or without further payment, where this option at the start, inception is the start, where the option at the start of the lease it's reasonably certain that the lessee will continue to use the asset, will, will, will elect to continue to keep the asset. Minimum lease payments are those payments over the lease term that the lessee is or can be required to make, excluding contingent rent, costs of service and tax to be paid and reimbursed, together with any amounts guaranteed these are called the guaranteed residual amounts. Fair value. Fair value of the asset will be given in the exam. He's not going to expect you to determine a fair value. He said the fair value of the asset is. But fair value is the value that a willing purchaser and a willing seller are prepared to pay and receive to transfer title of that asset. It's the cost, basically. It's the cost price of the asset. Interest rate implicit in the lease is the discount rate which, at the start of the lease, when it's applied to these minimum lease payments, it will bring the present value of the minimum lease payments back to equivalent fair value. In practice, of course, pretty much the whole of the exercise that we're about to start doing, that is, calculating exactly how much finance lease interest is included in each instalment, in practice that will be done for you by the lessor. The lessor will send you a schedule or maybe just a, an annual or a monthly statement to say your next instalment is due and included within the instalment is so many dollars worth of finance lease interest. So in practice, the calculation exercise is done for you. So it's a little bit of an artificial exercise which asks you to do it in the exam. You probably won't need to do it in, in real life. But what was working too that we had on Monday? What was working too? Goodwill. How often in a consolidation exercise, in a consolidation situation, in practice, how often will you calculate goodwill? We've owned the subsidy for 10 years. How many times will you calculate goodwill? Not how many times will you review it for impairment. That will be done annually. But how many times will you actually calculate it in practice? Once. Just once. In the year of acquisition. There's no need to calculate it again. You need to review it for impairment, but once calculated, it's calculated. This is different if it's a foreign subsidiary. So I will tell you differently when we get to P2. P2, you have to calculate for a foreign subsidiary, you have to calculate goodwill every time, every year. Yes, you do. Okay. 
Do you want to ask me that on P2? Um, just very briefly, because we said on, I said on Monday that goodwill is an asset of the subsidiary. Unrecognized, intangible, but it's still an asset of the subsidiary. And the rules with reference to foreign consolidation are that all assets and liabilities of the subsidiary shall be translated at the closing rate of exchange. And the closing rate of exchange 31st December 08 is likely going to be different than the closing rate of exchange in 09. So there's an exchange difference on the recalculation of goodwill and on the recalculation of the historic impairment of goodwill. That's why. But if it's a, uh, if it's a local subsidiary within the same country, then in practice you calculate goodwill once. But in the exam you'll have to do it. So we'll put in note to the marker. Note to the marker, this will have been done four years ago on acquisition. I don't want to do it again. That wouldn't score many marks. Wouldn't score any marks. Okay, page 114, the counting treatment. If I'm going to treat this asset as effectively belonging to me, uh, then my accounting should also reflect that substance. It doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the lessor. But if I've got substantial of the whole of the risks and rewards of ownership, if I've got freedom of access, if I can use the asset for as many hours as I want to use the asset, then that asset is effectively mine. So at the start, at the inception of the lease, the double entry will be debit TNCA and credit a, a liability account, the lessor's account, an obligations under finance lease account with the lower of the fair value of the asset or the present value of the minimum lease payments. He's not going to ask you to do that. He might ask you to say that you'll debit the cost of the asset and debit the obligations with the lower of, but he's not going to expect you to calculate the minimum lease payment present value and then compare it with the fair value to determine which is the lower. That's most unlikely. The only obligation recognized, notice this, the credit in the obligations account is the true cost of the asset, the fair value. It's the fair value, or present value of minimum lease payments. So the credit in the liability account is just the capital element. And yet I'm going to be paying installments which include an element of interest. My natural double entry is going to be credit, cash, debit obligations. But included in that debit obligations account is going to be the capital element of the installment plus the interest element of the installment. So what I must then do, I can do it in either of two ways. I can either split the debit and debit the obligations account with just the capital, debit an interest account with the interest. Or I can credit cash and debit obligations with the full amount and then credit obligations, debit interest. Is that clear? Do you want me to show you a T account on the screen? I've got one nod, so I'll sort out the one nod later. <clears throat> As installments are paid, each installment will repay some of the obligation, but it also includes an element of finance lease interest. The interest element needs to be debited, de charged is another word for debited, in case you'd forgotten. It needs to be charged to the statement of comprehensive income each year within finance costs. Finance lease interest paid. <clears throat> But then we have a problem. How do we calculate the interest in each individual installment? This is a problem for exams. It's not a problem for real life. And there are at least three possible ways. The straight line method. This is where you calculate how much is the interest over the lease. If it's a four-year lease, then divide that interest by four and put that amount in the income statement each year. Straight line method. 
It's an awful method. It's so simplistic. It's a dreadful method. But it can be used because smaller entities, small companies, it's not worth spending the time doing the calculations. IAS only relates to material matters. And if the lease is a single asset and the fair value is 8000 and we're in a multinational conglomerate situation, what's the point of spending time working out instalment in this, the interest in this instalment, interest in that instalment, interest in that instalment? So if the uh, lease is immaterial in the context of the company, it's not worth going through these better methods. You might as well just do straight line. Doesn't make a world of difference either. In addition, if you think about it, when I just said then, it doesn't make a world of difference. If I lease an asset in 2002, and it's a five-year lease, and I lease another asset in 2003, and that's a five-year lease, and another one in 2004, and another in 2005, and another in two... Surely as the lease interest on the early ones is big, the lease interest on the later ones will be, on the early ones, the lease interest on the early ones is now small by the time I get to 2006, and the lease which I take out in 2006 will have a lot of interest. But surely that's going to even out. So if I'm in the habit of leasing a new asset every year for five years, uh, then the lease interest is going to be pretty level. Probably. So straight line method or level spread, it's an awful method. Some of the digits method. Some of the digits is something which he has said he will not ask in the context of leases. But he may ask it in the context of depreciation. So while we're in leases, I've just told you that some of the digits will not be used in a lease question. But he has asked it as a depreciation point. So I'll show you how some of the digits works. Because it's relevant to you, it's not relevant to leases, but it is relevant to the exam. Some of the digits says we've got a, a four-year lease. And in year one, and two, and three, and four. So in the last year of the lease, let me do it in depreciation. In the last year of the asset's estimated useful life, in the last year of the asset's estimated useful life, there will be one part of depreciation. One bit. There's only one more year's worth of depreciation to go. So whatever the depreciation in the last year, that's it. That's one piece of depreciation. And then the principal says, well, if there's one piece of depreciation in the last year, then with two years to go, there must be twice as many. And if there's three years to go, so if we're only in the second year of the asset, then there must be three times as much depreciation as in the last year. And therefore, in the first year of the asset's life, there must be four bits of depreciation. Now, cumulatively, that means in total, there are ten bits of depreciation. Those ten bits are spread out. A hundred pound asset, a hundred dollar asset... It means that in year one, we're going to charge 40 depreciation, 30 in the second year, and 20 in the third, just 10 in the last year. So calculate how many bits there are, divide the value of the asset, the cost of the depreciable amount of the asset by the number of bits, and that will then give you the value per bit. It's also called the rule of 78. And it's, don't write this down, there's no need. Sometimes it's called the rule of 200. And sometimes it's called the rule of n over 2 times n plus 1. 
where n is the number of years that we're going to depreciate the asset. If it's a four-year asset, that's four over two times five, which is ten. Ten bits. If it's a twelve installment, and this is why it's called rule of seventy-eight, if it's a twelve installment, it's twelve over two times thirteen, which is seventy-eight. So if you were leasing an asset for one year, paying monthly installments, then there are seventy-eight bits of interest. Twelve in the first month, eleven in the second, and so on. 200 is a 24 months. 24 over 2 times 25 is 200. 300. 12 times 25, 300. Rule of 300, not 200. So 24 month depreciation calculation would say there were 300 bits. Okay? So that's how some of the digits works. And if you can't remember, and there is a, in the mini exercises, there's a sum of the digits calculation. You know those mini exercises that you've been doing this last two evenings? You might not have got to this one yet, but included within those mini exercises, there is a, a sum of the digits depreciation calculation. All right, so some of the digits will not be asked in leasing. He said this two years ago, two and a half years ago. And the, the ideal method then is the actuarial method. This uses the rate implicit in the lease. The rate implicit is, we said on the previous page, it's that rate which, when applied to the minimum lease payments, brings the present value of those minimum lease payments back to fair value. So that will be the rate implicit in the lease. In practice, it will be done for you. In the exam, the examiner will hopefully give you the implicit interest rate. H115, recording the finance charge. Debit finance cost, which you've just calculated, the interest for the year, and credit accruals, ready for us to pay the instalment. So when the instalment is paid, if I'm going to credit accruals, when the instalment is paid, it's going to be debit the obligations under finance lease account, Debit accruals with the accrued interest and credit cash with the instalment payment. Oh, it's written down for you. It's, it's next bullet point. Depreciation must be provided on the asset. Although it's not our asset, we are pretending that it is. In substance, it is, even though it's not in legal form. So depreciation must be provided if there's no reasonable certainty that the lessee will obtain ownership by the end of the lease term, the asset needs to be fully depreciated over the shorter of lease term and useful life. If there is reasonable certainty that the lessee will obtain ownership by the end of the lease term, for instance, a higher purchase contract, which I don't think you have here, then the asset should be depreciated over its estimated useful life. But if at the end of five years I have to return that asset, then clearly I need to be depreciating it over five years. In the statement of financial position, we're going to include, if it's TNCA, we're going to include the asset in non-current assets. Typically, you'd have a separate column in your disclosure note for leased assets, assets held under finance lease. The balance remaining at the year end, this obligation at the signing of the contract, and I've got an obligation under finance lease account, with the fair value of the asset, and I'm going to put that figure in the obligations account. And then I will make installment payments, but the only element of the installment going here is the capital element. The capital element of each installment as paid. Which means I'm going to have a carry down liability at the end of the year. 
brought down into the next year. That liability, that obligation, the sum of it is payable within 12 months. The rest of it may be payable years into the future. So that obligation needs to be split between current liability and long-term liability. And I'll show you how to do that. I'll show you how to calculate how much of that is current and therefore how much is long-term. Non-current liabilities, we've got the obligation under finance lease payable more than 12 months hence. Current liabilities, obligations under finance lease, payable within 12 months. As well as any accrued finance lease interest will be shown on the statement of financial position. Within the notes, halfway down the page, within the notes, obligation on the finance lease is, note, there needs to be a reconciliation between minimum lease payments and present value. And again, we have alternative forms of presentation. It may be shown gross or net. You've got it in your notes there with X's. But if we've got six years worth more of installments, then less than 12 months, I've got one installment, say 2,000. And then in years one to five, I have four more installments, 8,000. And then more than five, I've got one more installment. So in total, my minimum lease payments were 12,000. But that needs to be reconciled to the present value of the obligation. So I can put here less interest not yet accrued, say 2,715, say, then this will now give me the present value, 9,285 is the present value of these minimum lease payments still outstanding. That's the gross presentation. Net presentation it's going to take these figures, 2,000, 8,000, 2,000, and work out what is the present value of 2,000 payable in one year's time. What is the present value of 2,000 payable in year 2, 3, 4, and 5? And what is the present value of 2,000 payable in year 6? Now, again, I'm not prepared to calculate it. What I will say is, say... This is 1870. This is uh, 7110. And this is 305. It gives me a total of 9285. If you were asked to prepare a note for the finance lease reconciling the minimum lease payment with the present value, which method would you choose? Do you want to go through an exercise of calculating six present values? Or do you just want to put gross, 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 less interest not yet due? I know which one I would do. I would every time, <clears throat> I probably wouldn't because I like doing the present value calculations, but for ease and simplicity and speed, they'd go for gross. <sighs> right, statement of comprehensive income, although not specifically required, companies also tend to disclose the following in the notes of the financial statements. Uh, under the heading finance cost, they'll say how much finance lease interest is included within finance charges. And they'll also show 
either by way of disclosure notes separately, probably, that will show depreciation on finance leased assets. As a separate entity, rather than just depreciation on our assets, they will separately identify the depreciation on the finance leased assets. 